Is everyone ready for soot? Yeah. Yes. All right. I love that. Um, OK, so we had a, um, a little bit of a break thinking about soot. And remember yesterday, we talked a lot about um, inception and incipient particles and then kind of skimmed over how particles age. And we'll talk more about that today in more detail. Um, and uh, we mostly talk about things we don't know, we don't understand, right? And, and ways that if, you know, in the future, you could jump in and have a, a big contribution to the field because we really do need solutions to some of these, these questions and they can have a pretty big impact um, because it has so many negative um, consequences and positive. Like if you can control how it's formed, you actually have high value materials that, um, that you can, uh, that can be used for a lot of applications. So let's move on to um, how would we model inception. So what, what we want to do is be able to predict what's going to happen, right? Predict what the particles are going to look like, predict how much that we're going to have, predict what their radiative properties are going to be like because that will have a big impact on fires um, and, you know, other applications like absorption for climate change. So, um, so let's talk about modeling uh, inception. So we'll kind of inch our way through the whole process. And you know, this is actually a big problem. We don't know how to model soot. And most soot models are based on pyrene dimerizing and then boom, magic happens and a particle forms. So if you look at um, most papers that are talking about soot, that's what you'll see is there's a generation of pyrene and as soon as you generate pyrene, it's assumed you have particles. So, uh, so if we want to actually uh, do this problem um, in a way that we can, act, we can predict what the particles are going to look like and how many they're going to be and what their properties are going to be, we kind of have to understand a in more detail what's happening. So, so what would be nice is to keep the models up um, at least you know, at the same uh, level of understanding as we have from the experimental data. So I showed you a lot of results kind of indicated that we have chemistry happening that's causing these particles to form. Um, so for all you computational people, um, think about this. Let's talk about modeling SIP because there is no SIP model that does the chemistry we talked about yesterday. There's none out there and I'm gonna tell you why. Um, and you can probably guess if you're, you're modeling, doing chemical modeling, you'll probably know instantly what I'm saying. Um, and if you don't understand, the, if you don't know what the chemistry is, which you don't, then you're kind of in, you know, in the dark and you can start thinking about how you're going to implement it. And then when you're trying to do a practical application, you're going to find that like detailed model is way too much, you know, it's too computationally intensive. So you have to have a way then to reduce it. So then we have to understand what the main steps are that will allow us to reduce the mechanism and come to a point where we can get to basically the right answer um, with efficiency. That's a hard problem. Okay, so let's talk about modeling. So, so the first part of what we need to do for the chemical models is have a good gas phase model, right? So if you've been doing, you going to the lectures from uh, Mani Srathi in the mornings, you, you know, you're talking about how to have a good gas phase. Um, chemistry, chemical kinetic model. Um, so all those steps you do for the gas phase, you have to do for soot. Now this is a, a, a tall order because when you start thinking about it, you're going to be generating these huge molecular species. And you know when you're going through the theory part, these theoretical techniques that are people are using for the smaller gas phase species just don't, they just can't do these bigger species. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about kind of where we are, state of the art for that. Um, and, and you can start thinking, especially if you if you're, uh, do know anything about machine learning, this is kind of a good place to think about you know, applying machine learning approaches. Okay, so, so the first thing we need is a good gas phase model that will go to as large uh, species and will generate these radical species that we've been talking about, okay? So then there, in terms of inception, remember we talked about two um, major um, classifications of mechanisms. One is this um, mechanism we call nucleation that's thermodynamically driven. It's kind of like water vapor condensing into a droplet. Um, in that case, then you'd want to be able to form and grow PAHs. 
for both models, you're going to want to do this. This will be the growing the pHs is going to be the core of the nucleation um, mechanism. OK. Um, the next step um, would be understanding how you would put dimerization and nucleation into your model, and then growing from there. So, so you want to be able to understand how do you actually nucleate. Um, and that's actually just a nucleation is, is a hard problem. In, just physically, it's a hard problem. Um, <laughs> So, so that's the next thing you want to do for this type of model, right? If you're going to think about the chemistry um, on the chemical side for inception, then you're going to want to understand and how, how do you generate the, the radical species in your model. So, so, the, so they'll start out being gas phase. Then you under, want to understand the chemistry of these radical species. Are they just reacting with themselves? Are they reacting with, other, with closed shell species? Um, What's going on and how do we understand how those generate a particle? How do you get inception chemically? So, um, so you have some way of having like a radical chain uh, reaction or something. Um, and, and, and this is where you want to, that's the part where you start to think about clustering to a bigger um, species to actually condensed phase. Okay, so those are the kind of the main steps and then um, it, very likely, both mechanisms are important under different conditions, and you're going to want to be able to have both types of mechanisms going in your model. So that's a big task. That's, that's, a, that's a project and a project and a project, right? You're going to be really handling a lot, probably learning a great deal if you're, if you're trying to um, build one of these types of models. So let's start out with the chemistry. What are people doing now? So here are, here's just a, an example from one paper um, where this group collected a whole bunch of models from the literature and compared them all. So this is a nice paper that just came out really recently. And you can see from different places, um, so we have our, our Kaust model. Um, it's uh, either uh, Mani's or Amir Farouk's model. I don't know, what, I can't remember which one is, is included. Um, we have um, the Aachen model, so, um, Heinz Pitch's group um, is up there. So we have some of the, the main models that were compared. The ABF model is a very old one. Um, and, but you can see there, they have different levels of, com of complexity. But you know, generally, they're not terribly complex because you can't go into a lot of detail if you're trying to do something that's embedded in an LES code, right? That's, that's actually doing um, turbulence or, or you have to worry about, um, in, like a CFD model, it's hard to run a, a really complex chemistry model. OK, so, so these are some basics. And you notice, so on the bottom where it says A1, that means a single aromatic ring. So that's a, a benzene type. Um, species. So A1 is a single aromatic ring. So all of these models are actually, you know, they're, they're getting up to generating benzene. Okay, so then you need to go from benzene, because you're not going to stop there, you need to start building on, on to benzene. Okay, so here's how people do this. Um, here are some examples of going from benzene, so one aromatic ring, to two aromatic, aromatic rings. So, um, so you often see in papers A1, A2, A3, that's, that's the numbers count the number of aromatic rings in, in your molecular species. OK, so, so this one, the top um, root is the, the, this is a paper from Bill Green's group. Um, the top root they've labeled the Franklock root, and that's a Hakka-based. They're all, actually, if you look at them, they're all Hakka-based um, mechanisms. Um, so you start out with, actually, they started out with benzene. They added an acetylene, and then they made that um, phenylacetylene. So you take off, remember, it's hydrogen abstraction. So you take off a hydrogen, then acetylene addition, right? And then you lose a hydrogen. So, so you see the second one, it goes you hydrogen abstraction. The first step is hydrogen abstraction. The next step on the top route is an acetylene addition. Right? Um, and then you have a species that has a second chain um, with, with the acetylene added. And then you end up making a, um, a reaction that, that forms a ring. Okay? So, so that's the, um, and, and the end, you, um, 
actually uh, end up with naphthalene, which is the two, two aromatic rings, a closed shell structure that's two aromatic rings. Okay, all of these end up going to naphthalene, which is a very stable species. So we see, the, so we see this mass in our mass spectra. Um, this is a common species for people to identify in flames, this naphthalene. Okay, um, so that's going from one ring to two rings. Oops. Um, and here's going from two rings to three rings, or from one ring to seven rings, just sequentially adding, usually adding um, a, an acetylene or a C2 type um, a functional group to a, so it could be an ethylene type or a vinyl type, these are all C2 um, species, um, onto your, your molecular species. And one of the reasons that um, uh, this is supported, this type of growth is supported by data, is when you look at um, mass spec in a flame as you go from the lowest height to, and, and go up to different heights above the burner, what you'll see, so basically as a function of time in your flame, your reaction time, you'll see the addition, you'll start out with smaller masses, and then you see actually two carbon um, sequences. So you'll have these large peaks that look like you're adding two carbon species, and sometimes they'll complete, so it's, it's like you're adding acetylene, sometimes you're completing a ring, um, and so there are different numbers of hydrogens on them, but you'll end up seeing this sequence. So this is supported by data, and you know, HACA is probably a very um, important uh, mechanism, as we talked about yesterday. Okay, so, uh, so there's our growth, our, our molecular growth. Um, and then you want to nucleate these, these species. Once they get to be large enough, they can nucleate. Here's a mechanism um, from Frank, the, uh, Michael Frankluck's group um, showing the dimerization of pyrene. Now, we know that pyrene, thermodynamically, it's not, the pyrene dimer or condensed pyrene is not stable um, at flame temperatures. It's, it's gonna, you know, it's, uh, it's um, boiling point or sublimation point is well below the flame temperature, so, so it shouldn't be stable. The idea is, if you can stabilize a physical dimer long enough, you might be able to get a reaction be the, between the two pyrenes that will cause them to be covalently bound. So this is a study where they were trying to show that you have enough like rotational states in the pyrene that, that might allow you to um, distribute the energy in a way that you could possibly get a stabilization of a, of a dimer physically. Okay. Um, we can, and, and once you, start to have, you um, start talking about condensation, you might want to think, okay, where are we, or, you know, nucleation, where are we um, in, in our, our, our chemical space? How can we actually, like, so it's going to be hard to nucleate pyrene. It's just so small. Like, even if you could get one dimer, it's going to be hard to take in more um, species of that size. Okay, so here's another study um, where they looked at coronine, which is a bigger molecular species. Um, it's seven rings, and it's the condensation of um, coronine at 800K. So that's a pretty low temperature. So if we're talking about flame temperatures, 800K is pretty low, um, and it's not likely that we're gonna have inception at those low temperatures. So coronine isn't gonna nucleate at higher temperatures. So what is going to nucleate at higher temperatures? Um, so here's, a, they, they extended the study, um, and you see that on the, the bottom axis of that graph, um, where it says, it says mass, and then it says PAH, and it has the number of rings. So, so that's the x-axis, and on the y-axis is temperature. So if you look at that graph, you can see that you know when we start to get um, nucleation, say about a thousand Kelvin or so, um, you're or maybe eleven hundred. You you're around a ten, a eleven. So that number of of aromatic rings is about where you might expect some physical dimerization or physical nucleation. Okay, so so that's what a lot of that's kind of the the range at which. You know, people say 
A11 is probably about the right size. Um, so a number of studies have, have indicated that's about the right size. Um, so that's kind of what you'd be looking for in your flame if you're looking for nucleation of these, of, um, that's causing uh, inception. Okay. Um, I added, oh yeah, so here, so then we want to go to, um, okay, so now we're going back, we're, we're going back to the other side of our diagram where we have our chemical model. So the, the, the first part we talked about was nu nucleation inception. So now what about chemical inception, right? So, um, and remember that what we were talking about yesterday is that maybe these resonant stabilized radicals are the species that are helping us nucleate through some kind of radical chain reaction or some, some mechanism invol involving these radicals. So what we need to do then is start to understand these radicals and how are we forming them? And then how are they reacting to generate a particle, right? So we have, this is a really nice study um, uh, that was done at Sandia by David Osborne and Craig Tages' group. Um, and it, so it shows at the top left hand, let's see if I can get this, uh, this pointer going. I'm not sure it's going to work. It's kind of slow. OK, so this up here in the upper left-hand corner um, is propargyl. So remember, we were talking about propargyl being a very happy, um, very active um, radical species in a flame. And people think that propargyl reacts with propargyl to generate benzene. So there's been a lot of study on that. Um, that so that propargyl in this so the, here we have HACA generating these RSRs. So we have a combination of the HACA mechanism with an RSR generation mechanism. So this is propargyl reacts with acetylene to generate a C5 species, either a linear or chain C5 species. So that's um, one vinyl pent pentane or pentene, pentine. No, one vinyl pentene, uh, pentanyl. One vinyl pentanyl. So um, YL um, refers to radical. So if you have, so if you have cyclopentadiene, then you're going to have a closed shell, five-membered ring with um, a double bond. Right, ene means double bond. So so cyclopentadiene would be the double bond, and then that lower left hand would be um, cyclopentadienyl. So it's it's a YL instead of the E at the end. So that will tell you if it's a radical species. Um, so um, on the upper right, so we see we have a chain. So we have one vinyl pentanyl. And then, then there's a, just a question mark. What happens to that? Don't know. Um, a, an arrow going down, you have that uh, propargyl react with acetylene. And it goes to uh, cyclopentadienyl. OK? So that's. Um, uh, so that is a resonance stabilized radical. Notice there are two double bonds next to where the lone electron is. That lone electron pops into the p orbital on that carbon and then participates in the pi um, delocalization of the electrons. Okay, so then you add another acetylene and you generate this species called tropyl, which is a seven membered ring, and that's also a resonance stabilized radical. Then you add another acetylene, you generate the C9 species, and that might look familiar to you from yesterday. You generate um, indine, which becomes indinyl, right? So that's another resonance stabilized radical. Okay, so now you have this like chain of events involving acetylene that's gonna generate a whole series of uh, radicals. And these are the radicals, these masses match the masses we see all the time. Doesn't matter what the the fuel, well, it does matter a little bit what the fuel is. If we have pyrolysis, we often will, and it's a bigger species that's our fuel, we don't see the smaller ones until they start to, the species starts to break up. At the lower temperatures, we want to see the smaller ones. But we do see, like if we do propyne, then we'll see all the, you know, um, it makes propargyl, and then we'll see all these species. So once you have propargyl, you can actually see all these. Once you have cyclopentadienyl, 
you'll see the rest of them to higher masses. So um, as long as we have acetylene available to us or high enough temperature to have it, then we're going to generate these other radicals. So we actually see these masses. The question is, so, and you can see on the left-hand side the kinetics for how this happens. So the blue curve um, on the left-hand side is propargyl. Um, so it re once it starts to react with um, acetylene, it goes away, and then you see the um, C C5 species come up, the cyclopentadienyl comes up in orange, and then it starts to go away, and the, the um, mass 91 of the C7 species comes up. So um, this is a really nice study showing the different species as they appear in the mass spectra. OK. Um, and this is the potential energy surface uh, for the acetylene, I mean, the propargyl um, reacting with the acetylene and then going through all the different states. So you, you, know, you have start out with a pretty high potential energy with the um, propargyl plus acetylene. Um, you go through over a, a pretty small barrier to start getting to the um, next, the C5 species, either the chain or the cyclic, you know, final cycle, the, the cyclopentadienyl. Um, and then you go over a barrier to get to um, vinyl cyclopentadienyl is, is uh, this pointer doesn't work so well, but let's see if I can get it down there. So over here, this is um, the C7. So you're going from C5. <laughs> there's a big delay in this. OK, there's our C5 species, right? And you add an acetylene, and you end up with this C7. That's the tropal. This is also C7 down here. This right there, VCP. Um, that's vinyl cyclopentadienyl, that's C7 species. So you have a couple of different C7 species, and then here's a third one right here. That's benzyl. So um, remember I showed you that um, uh, stabilomer grid uh, yesterday, and I added benzyl on there, and I said, okay, here's the, the stabilomer of radicals, right, for that size radical. Um, uh, so that's benzyl. You can see it has a lower potential energy surface, uh, lower state right there in green than either the tropo or the vinyl cyclopentadienyl. So all of them are C7. Okay, and then you end up going over to indine and indenyl. Okay, so this is so this is where um, I kind of want to show you now how, like, if you're trying to understand these radicals, how complicated this can start to get. Okay, and and where we are in figuring some of this out. OK, so remember I said yesterday, we said, OK, well, it looks like we have vinyl cyclopentadienyl. And everyone was like, no, no, you're wrong. And in fact, the very first time I presented this at a meeting, it was at the national meeting, national combustion meeting in um, Pasadena. And, and I was giving a plenary talk. And I, I said, OK, well, we have, you know, this is what's happening. We see this. We see mass 91, vinyl cyclopentadienyl. And then I went to the reception afterwards, and someone shouted across the room, you're full of shit. And I was like, what? <laughs> oh, no. I really upset someone. Um, so I was like, I, like going through the crowd trying to find this person. I found him. He was like, I was like, OK, what's wrong? What did I do wrong? And he was like, that is not vinyl cyclopentadienyl. Um, so I was like, OK, OK, well, let's talk about this. <laughs> so um, he said, on my case, like, since then, he's, like, obsessed with this. And I was like, OK, OK, let's, let's figure this out. So we started this study. This is in response to that talk and that person, like, telling me I'm full of shit. Um, we, we started this study. I actually invited him to be uh, to be part of the study, and he declined. <laughs> but but, I, but um, I know him, and he's he's just a wacky guy. Um, <laughs> so, okay, so the center of this uh, figure here on the right. Uh, let's see if I can get this pointer thingy to work. I should have brought my laser pointer. Okay, there we are, right up there, Ooh, right there. Okay. Um, that is vinyl cyclopentadienyl, that very center guy. Um, okay, that's mass 91. 
Um, that's what we think when you add a, when you add a C2 to a five-membered ring, the cyclopentadienyl, you get the five-membered ring with the two on the side, right? It's not the lowest state, but I, but we think you get that. Okay, so see up at the top left hand, the blue, you see the cyclopentadienyl and the acetylene? That's where we're gonna start. And we say, okay, we add that. And it turns out, um, we think that you're going to um, vinyl cyclopentadienyl. You also can go up to tropyl, right? So if you, you add those two, you can get to tropyl. Remember, that's what the last study I was showing you with the kinetics said. You're gonna go to tropyl. So someone else was telling me, no, you're wrong, it goes to tropyl. So I was like, okay, we, we, we gotta get this. So, okay, we get to go to tropyl. So another possibility, um, do you see benzyl on there? Yeah, benzyl's on there too, right? So another possibility is we go to benzyl, right? So it's possible we go from vinyl cyclopentadienyl to benzyl, right? So that's another option. It turns out that if you um, uh, uh, take off a hydrogen from vinyl cyclopentadienyl, you can get fovanilene, and that can go to benzyl. Okay, so, and then there are a lot of, so, and then a, another, once you get to benzyl, you can go to orthotolyl, which is basically a rearrangement of the radical, right? So um, that's another mass 91, so you basically have a hydrogen um, pops from the side up to the uh, methyl sitting up at the top and makes a C3, and you, you have a radical site on, on the um, phenyl ring, okay? so. So now there are a bunch of different possibilities. There's a recent nature um, astronomy paper. So people are really interested in this chemistry in like these, um, these molecular clouds in interstellar space because they can see these, um, these uh, spectroscopic signatures from them. And they've been trying to figure out how some of these pHs are formed. So there was a recent um, nature astronomy paper looking at benzene. Um, generating benzyl, adding to methyl group and generating benzyl. So there's been a lot of like interesting um, papers coming out on this. So um, what we did is we we collaborated with Judith Zador's group. Um, I, if you I don't know if you know who she is, but she's at Sandia, and um, she's been focusing. She's one of the groups. She has runs one of these groups that focuses on automated. Um, a calculations theory to automate, automatically generate potential energy surfaces. And basically, do if you've ever done density fun functional theory calculations, you know that it's very time consuming. You, you try to get the minimum state, minimum you know, initial states of the reactants, and you try to react them, you try to find the transition state, and, and there are a whole bunch of different ways things can go, and you, and you have to keep, it's kind of like, a, try this and try that, it takes a whole long time. But you can imagine a computer could do that like, you know, much faster than any one of us could do that, right? So there are a, a number of groups that are starting to try to do this type of thing. So she wrote a code called Kinbot, and it's actually available to anyone who wants to use it. You can, you know, get it, you, especially if you talk to her, she's really excited to have new people using her code. So if you want to try it, um, I really highly recommend doing that. So we collaborated with her. Um, let's see if I can get this to, yes. And here is the potential energy surface she generated for um, uh, cyclopentadienyl plus acetylene. This is a reduced surface. Um, it turns out that there are over 1,000 isomers for C7H7. So when you actually do the theory and probe um, for different isomers, different states that this could go to, there are over 1,000. So that's a lot to deal with, right? And this is where we have the problem. This is why we're not further along. It's because it's just so hard to do this stuff. And these calculations take a long time to run. But if you can do this in an automated way, then you can start to have a hope of actually trying to find the lowest energy states. Um, so uh, so her, she and um, her postdoc, Carlos Marti, 
uh, did these calculations. So this is what they call it, the trimmed potential energy surface. And each one of these circles is one of those, if you were to draw it out linearly on that, like the graph that I was showing you initially, each one of those circles would be a well. Each one of those lines would be a transition state. And the thickness of the line is how fast, so how low the transition state is, so how low in energy it is, so how fast could, would the rate constant be? So it gives you an indication of, oh, this is linked to that really, um, and there's a, a fast rate going from this species to that species. Okay, so the box is where we start. That's the cyclopentadienyl plus acetylene. So that's our starting point. And you see, that's just, one, that's just one starting point. We call that the entry point or the entry pathway is through that red box into the C7 potential energy surface. Okay, this is just the potential energy surface. Now you have to do the calculations for the rate constant as you're, you know, if you're sitting in on the um, chemistry talks, uh, lectures, uh, then you have to do the rate constants, right? So they ha they're in the process of getting this kind of debug, just getting the rate constant. So, but this is actually kind of where the state of the field is. Um, this is C7. And now if you think that we're going to go to maybe C7 plus C7 or, you know, C9, we start to, like, start get into a real, you know, difficult computational problem. Um, this is an area where you could break new ground in figuring out ways to do this. So if you're a computational person and you're really interested in this type of work, this is definitely an area. And it's not just in this field, but it's in a lot of fields where we have you know, a lot of um, complexity in, in these reactions. Okay. Um, so. Yes, come on. Okay, there we go. So this is a different entry point. Um, this is through fovenylene plus H. So that's a whole different surface. Um, the the uh, lines are color-coded by the temperature at which we think they activate. Those um, reactions are, start to proceed quickly enough. Um, so that gives you an idea of, you know, what, at what temperature you, would you expect to see these reactants going to the specific products. So this is, so, okay, so now we have all of this information, so, so for C7, they did this, they calculated rate constants for all of these reactions, and then we put this into a chemical code and tried to run, you know, uh, run experiments and compare the model to the experiments. Um, so it gets, it's just, it, you know, it gets interesting, um, and we definitely don't have it all worked out. But here's, um, the total number of ions um, when we see particles. So this, remember, this is our aerosol mass spec. We don't see signal when we don't have particles. Okay, so this is the total number of ions we get for the entire mass spectrum. We just add it all up. Um, and for three different fuels. And the first thing um, that you should think notice is the fuels are really different, right? That's really cool. So the fuels are, the re results are different. Um, and this is even more fascinating. If you do pyrolysis, you just put the fuel in there um, and you run the pyrolysis, look how different the fuels are. And we noticed that when we were talking yesterday that we get particle formation at different temperatures depending on whether we have ethylene or indine or ethylene plus indine, right? This is really fascinating. This tells you that there's some interest in chemistry that you know, is so temperature dependent. There's something really, really interesting about just changing. I, wouldn't have, I, I actually would not have guessed it would be so different. OK, so that's the total ions. Now let's look at the radicals. So, and let's just look at this mass 91 radical, the C7H7 um, radical. Um, so this is what it looks like for the C7H7 radical is really different depending on temperature. It's really different depending on fuel um, for, the, for the three fuels. So we have, so this, what this tells you when you see something that has this high variability is that you can probably figure some cool stuff out. Like you have some kind of handles really sensitive to this. Um, and you know, when you see things that are varying a lot depending on one parameter, 
this will tell you, like, okay, I have, I have a thread I can pull to see if I can figure something out. Okay, so we did these experiments, and we're not done, you know, like this, this is, can go on. Um, this is a lot of stuff that can be done. So what we did is we then did our, um, we changed our photon energy um, for each of these um, conditions and tried to figure out which radicals we had at mass 91. So we had you know, selection we thought we would get, um, so we thought we better try it and look at it. So for the different, in the top left hand, so this is all mass on A1. The top left hand one, um, there's ethylene um, for the flame, butane for a flame, and notice those are the top two, the solid um, purple and the uh, pinkish um, dashed line. Notice that for the flame, the PIE curves are really, really different. Right? That means we have different isomers for the two different flames. Um, we often see them lying on top of each other for different, you know, for different radical species. Um, but this is not, we have different uh, uh, isomers for mass 91. The, the bottom curve, that's um, uh, for the pyrolysis for ethylene, and that is really different from the ethylene flame. It's different from both flames. It's different from ethylene flame. So this is kind of fascinating. We're, we're actually seeing some really big differences depending on condition. That's the differences in the isomers that are generating that curve, that, that peak, mass 91. OK, so we can take our reference curves that we ha have got from the literature um, and fit those. And the reference curves for the different isomers you see in the second figure down, that's um, the flame data. And the two reference curves for benzyl and vinyl cyclopentadienyl, you see they have very, very different shapes. So we can do a linear combination of those um, and fit the curve and say, OK, we think we have you know, vinyl cyclopentadienyl benzyl. And we add, you know, we added, when we did the fit, we added the other isomers as well. But it looked like we only have these two. So the error bars are huge. There's a large uncertainty on this. Um, but, we, but this is how our, our best fit for the data came out. If the, bo if the bottom on the pyrolysis, you see that you know, it looks like we don't have benzyl at all on the pyrolysis. Um, we have vinyl cyclopentadiol and, and um, maybe, maybe some tropyl. You know, it's hard to know if our curvature is right. Um, and that, those two curve, curve at different kind of rates. So, um, but Oh, it doesn't look like we have benzyl. So that tells us that you know, under different conditions, we're seeing different chemistry. We're seeing if that chemistry is getting like scrambled, right? Depending on what your condition is. So this is actually kind of tells us a little bit about the radical chemistry. This is what we're going to have to figure out if we need, to, if we want to understand what's going on. Um, and and I, I don't want to say like, oh, if we don't figure it out, we'll never figure. You know, we'll never know what's going on. But the closer we can get to understanding some of how this happens um, and where we can take shortcuts and where we can make approximations, then we, you know, the closer we get to solving this problem. Okay. Um, and then, so then we compared the measurements to the model. So we, we took two models that are in the literature. Um, one is from Kaust. It's um, from Amir Farouk's group. We call it the Jin Farouk model. Um, because Jin is the first author on the papers. Um, and then the other is the Lawrence Livermore kinetic code. We, used, we took that one. Um, just models that are frequently used for this type of study, right? Um, and we modified it with all the rate constants that um, Udit, uh, Carlos and Udit gave us. And the um, initial models and dashed the um, new updated models and the solid lines, and then compared it to what we, the ratio of the, of the isomers we thought we got from the data. And you know, we're not, we're not too far off, but we're not too close either. Like we have big error bars. Um, but what we can say is, OK, it really does look like we have different isomers. Um, we're not crazy. We're not full of shit, really. Um, but uh, there's, a lot, there's a long way to go. OK, so, and, and there's definitely more work people can do. This is like just a start. And it would be better to figure out how to measure these isomers better than the way we have. 
Okay, so there, there's another open, uh, open, completely open area for someone to come in and, and really nail this type of chemistry. Okay. So, um, yeah, and so here's the comparison with the flame data. And we, I mean, still, we're, we're, we're doing okay, but not great. And, you know, I wouldn't say this is like total success. But, yeah, there's, there's more work to be do, done. Okay. So where do we get, go then with, clust, with um, uh, inception, right? We have to understand chemical clustering. And we talked about yesterday, um, there were a couple of potential, you know, like uh, clustering mechanisms that are out in the literature. This one we talked about yesterday, the one um, doing like haka on a, and then a reacting species with the, um, this uh, kinetic Monte Carlo approach. Um, I want my computer's really slow. Um, and then here's another one um, where they're like clustering radicals, um, uh, um, not resonance stabilized radicals, so it might be a little bit harder to do this because they're more stable species. Um, but still, it's like a, you know a, a step in the right direction, I think. And this is the one that we proposed with resonance stabilized radicals. So we're we're kind of like evolving in this direction. Um, and, and there's definitely, this is just like kind of, I would say probably on the slope of things, we're just kind of like just starting. Like, you know, there's probably a huge amount of work that's going to take place in the future. Um, okay, so, so that's kind of like where we are. And so, so we just went through this whole um, series of kind of where we are on this, but you can t see that we're in the like very first steps of trying to solve this problem, even though we've been working on it for decades, right? This is a, like, a problem we've been really trying hard to solve for a long time. But I think right now we're just at the point where we're getting these computational approaches that are really, really promising that will help us like just take off into the, the next era, okay? So, um, so please, if you're a computational person, think about like it taking on this problem. Um, okay. Uh, so we talked about what what are the mechanisms mechanisms of inception and how do we describe the particles. And the next phase, if this comes up, yes, we're going to talk about um, the mechanisms of particle growth and aging. Um, and and then how do we describe those particles as they evolve. So, uh, and then we'll end up talking about oxidation later, and a little bit later. Okay, so are there any questions about inception before I move on to um, evolution, growth, maturation? Okay. Ready, growth. Okay, so remember yesterday we talked about Particles growing, um, I didn't say how they grew. I just said they could, you know, maybe like coalesce, you know, like bump into each other and merge, um, or um, they could add on to the surface. So we'll, we'll see if we can kind of nail down some ways of thinking about this. Um, carbonization and graphitization, like basically how the structure evolved, like how do we, I think, so personally, I think what's happening is, and we don't have enough data on this, I think what's happening is it's not like um, being all disordered and then slowly ordering, like from like just ordering, like annealing uh, the particles. I think it's you have a this disordered incipient particle and then you're adding onto the surface in an ordered way. So I think I think what's happening is is the growth is causing the order in the shells around the um, disordered core. So we need to kind of, fun, kind of find a mechanism that will allow us to do that kind of ordered growth. But we're definitely not there yet. Um, and then property evolution, um, which is related a lot to the, the particle um, uh, fine structure itself. So here are all the different properties that change um, that we talked about yesterday. Um, so it's like, you know, the actual physical structure and size and, and then all the thermodynamic properties, the optical properties of the particles will evolve with time. And they all have an impact on something, right? They're all, like, since soot is, like, has, 
you know, it's reactivity. That's going to have an effect on health. It's going to have an effect on air quality. Um, it's going to have an effect on, on um, whether you can get rid of it easily in a, a particle, like a, an after-treatment system, a, a filter, right? How do you oxidize it off a filter? So all this stuff is going to have a big effect on how you're dealing with the particles um, and how much impact they have. Optical properties, climate change is a big one. Um, or, you know, um, propagation of fires, that's the optical properties. These, and, and, and how you use it, like in a gas, uh, a glass furnace, right? That has to do with optical properties. So we want to know everything we can about the particle, and we can also use some of this to understand the particles as they evolve. Um, so um, let's just review. This is what the incipient particles looked like on the left-hand side. So that's, um, this is from the uh, premix burner, extract from a premix burner. Um, so remember, the left-hand side looked like it kind of spread out maybe. On the right-hand side is, is higher up in the burner, and those are more mature particles. And it looks like these first particles that are formed um, are, are, are kind of circular, right? uh, spherical. Um, if we uh, use a different technique to look at them, though, um, this is helium ion microscopy. So the left is transmission electron microscopy. The right is helium ion microscopy. And this is the same burner, same flame, same fuel, um, using a different technique. And you notice the particles that they see are not spherical, right? They're kind of like a, like they have edges. They, they are not spherical particles. They look kind of uh, different. Like the particles all kind of look, have different shapes. So, um, so this like is an indication that we really have to think about how we're going to make these measurements. Like, how are we just going to do, how are we going to figure this out? This is it's so it's just such a hard problem, right? You're in this high temperature environment. If you go to extract, you may perturb everything. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, okay. So, um, so how much do we even know about these particles? Um, this is what the mature particle looks like again, right? It's we have this. Um, these graphite, um, uh, we have this disordered core, these foci that are probably our incipient particles, disordered. And then we add on layers of turbostratic graphene. Remember, it's like, or turbostratic graphite. So it's like sheets of graphene that are disordered, uh, ori oriented randomly relative to each other. Um, and then we have the agglomerates that are covered then with a coating of graphene or multiple layers of graphene holding those, those primary particles together. So this is, um, and then we have this, on the left-hand side is actually TEM image of a graphite, of a, a subparticle, a mature subparticle that was extracted from a flame. Um, and we look at that morphology and you can identify the stringiness by a fractal dimension. Um, and um, this fractal dimension for soot, it doesn't, do, so many different types of um, combustors produce the same stringiness. It, so, and it has a fractal dimension between 1.8 and 1.9. So that defines the stringiness. That's a typical, very typical um, mature soot particle. So here is kind of an example of that. Like, it doesn't seem to matter, like whether you come out of a forest fire, uh, or that, that's an urban plume from P Portugal. Oh, there's the Tyrolean Iceman again. Um, uh, aircraft exhaust, you know, sometimes, you know, maybe there's more necking, you know, there's like overlayers, but the stringiness seems to be consistent um, unless the particles are coated and restructured. So, you know, you see that we have very similar, um, you know, if we're coming from a diesel engine, Aircraft exhaust, seeing a biomass burning plume and you know uh, fires, um, that's really fascinating. It just gives us a lot of hope that we can figure out what's going on um, because we have so much consistency. Okay, so remember from yesterday, I'm just going to do a little bit of review here. We had we saw this yesterday. Different heights in a, um, this is a premix flame. Different heights in the flame, with the lowest being at the bottom, um, uh, particle size distribution. So low in the flame, we see incipient particles, a few nanometers in size. And then as we go up in size, we actually see another mode growing in. And that becomes our big um, 
uh, larger mode and it keeps just getting bigger. Um, as we, so that's going up in the flame. Um, so the properties, um, as we go up in the flame, maturity increases. Um, the conjugation length of those graphene sheets increases. The um, optical band gap decreases. And we have increasing absorption at long wavelengths. So that's why we get the black color of the particles. The top um, shows the um, absorption cross-section with that dispersion exponent, remember from yesterday. So the dispersion exponent decreases as you go up in the flame. So what we see is as we go up in the flame, I mean, as, as we increase in maturity, again, these um, properties all change. So we have an um, increasing carbon to hydrogen ratio, um, increasing density, right, largely because um, you're getting the, the interlayer spacing is getting smaller, um, and a specific heat uh, also changes, and so does the volumetric um, heat, spe um, specific heat um, or heat capacity also we think changes, but we don't know. So, um, so I'm going to tell you about a project that kind of has a little bit of a story behind it. Um, I was, so I, I was diagnosed with breast cancer about five years ago, and um, I was, I had to go on medical leave because I was doing, you know, chemo and everything. And um, uh, my, my boss said, you absolutely cannot do any work. No work whatsoever. Do not touch anything. It'll be illegal because you're on medical leave. So I was like, oh, man, I, how am I going to not do work? Like, that's all, like, that, that's going to keep me sane, right? I was like, oh. And then my, my oncologist said, okay, there's this thing called chemo brain. And it makes you, like, fuzzy and you can't really think. And, you know, it could be six months or it could be a year for the, or it could be the rest of your life you won't be able to think. And I'm like, Oh my gosh! This is like how like I can't. This that that threw me into a panic. It wasn't the cancer itself. It was the thought that I wouldn't be able to think again. So I was like, Oh man, what do I do? And she said, I want you to do crossword puzzles. And I was like, Crossword puzzles? And she said, I want you, want you to keep your brain active. And I was like, Okay, okay. I, I just have to like sit down or read papers on something else. I'm just going to like learn something new, and it won't be work, because it won't be any project I'm paid for. So I was like, OK. So, um, so I was like reading papers, and I was like, there was this controversy that was coming up. Like people were like saying, oh, so density stays the same. And, you know, and then there are these models that required, in, in order to do the model, they required a specific heat. And they're saying specific heat stays the same all the way through the maturity. I was like, that just can't be true. That just cannot be true. So I thought, OK, well, I'm just going to go look in the literature, and I'm going to just plot it. I'm just going to find all the papers with um, different species um, like, you know, pyrene, what does pyrene, you know, like it has a size, um, and if we, let's just assume that the, like we have nucleation of different size species, um, and what's happening as the particles mature are the different species are growing, so I'm just going to plot the specific key as a function of uh, particle size, and the density as a function of particle size for, you know, solid um, PAHs. So I went and looked and found every paper I could possibly find. It totally kept me entertained for the time I was at home. Um, and I plotted the density and the specific heat. So I'm going to tell you, show you what happened um, in the process of doing that. OK, so the density is really important um, for doing modeling and for understanding a lot of these diagnostics that we do. Um, the specific heat, like, sorry, slow. Specific heat and volumetric heat capacity are also very important for understanding um, some of these particles, especially when you're doing solving energy balance equations. Um, you have to understand how much heat the particle can hold, right? So these are really important for doing that type of, of calculation. So if you're trying to calculate radiation or, 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 or analyze laser-induced incandescence, you kind of have to know these parameters. Um, OK. so. So this is, uh, sorry, so this is what we're doing. We're trying to find how the density specific heat, volumetric heat capacity change with maturity and temperature and um, whether we can connect those to measurements. OK. So I found 47 um, different uh, data for 47 different solid um, hydrocarbons. Right? 
Um, and they were, they were like pericondensed, catechin. So pericondensed is like when you have them all, the rings all kind of clumped, you know, close together with as many sides shared as possible. Um, catechondensed is when they're, the rings are all in a line. Um, they, and they span a wide, a wide range, the kind of basically the range of carbon to hydrogen ratios you see for incipient particles. So that's what I was fascinated about. Like, how do you go from the, um, the gas phase, and the first particles are probably like very similar to the gas phase, all the way to like when you get to mature so. So I found all, all of these different hydrocarbons, and some of them had five member rings, some had seven member rings, some of them had um, ali, you know, uh, aliphatic side chains, or so um, alkane chains or alkene chains coming off of them. And, and I found data for, for all of these guys. Um, so here's um, the density and the um, specific heat plotted as a function of the molecular weight. Um, and that actually looks like there's a, even a correlation. It does it, it's like um, uh, the specific heat goes down with increasing uh, molecular weight and the um, density goes up. And I was like, oh, well, I actually didn't really know what to expect and that's kind of interesting. And it's like, it kind of does seem to have a trend. I probably could fit that. But then, then I was like, oh, okay. So um, what if I plot it as a function of C over H, which is what I had, you know, kind of, oh, oh yeah. And this, there's this outlier, right? There are a couple, out, there are a few outliers. I was like, so what's special about these guys? Um, so notice that they're bridged um, aromatics or they have extra chains, right? So they have, like more hydrogen than you would expect for a peri-condensed um, pH, right? Um, so we're gonna break in a minute. I'm not gonna forget. So I plotted it as a function of C over H, right? And then that correlation just like fell right into line. I was like, oh, I totally did not expect this. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad I got cancer. Like, this is like, this is, I like, so it's just so, I didn't, well, I didn't actually say that. But, um, but I was actually really excited. It's like, this is, I never would have done this. I was just kind of like messing around just to keep myself entertained. And this is, this is what I, I saw. I was like, oh, this is like really cool. I wonder what that means. I wonder if I can figure out a way to, to, to understand this. Um, so we're gonna go for it. This is break time, right? Three o'clock, is it break time? We're gonna go for a break and I'll tell you the end of the story when we get back.